Great, thanks everyone. Um, so we're a nice small group. Um, so I'm gonna try and monitor chat as I go. And I think we'll be able to make this kind of conversational. Um, so if you have questions um, as we go, feel free to chat them in um, and we'll get started. So what we're gonna do um, in this demo today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about data management plans and the work we've been doing around machine actionable DMPs, which really formed the basis of how we made this integration between the DMP tool and our space possible. Um, then Rory is going to look at electronic lab notebooks and talk about our space. Um, and then we will demo our new integration um, and talk about um, next steps for integrating um, kind of the planning stage of research as the DMP and the active phase of research as represented in electronic lab notebooks. So uh, my name is Maria Pretzelis and I'm with the California Digital Library. So we work out of the University of California. Um, so there are many different campuses in the UC system and CDL works system-wide. So we work with all of the different um, campuses. Um, we also work on a lot of international initiatives um, that you may have heard of. Uh, so my department is the UC3 department, and at UC3 we work in a, free, a few different areas that touch on open science and really support um, that uh, in terms of research data management, which is my sort of my piece of that pie. Uh, we also work in data publication and data metrics, particularly with the Dryad uh, Generalist Data Repository. We also do a lot of work around persistent identifiers, specifically the ROAR, which is the Research Organization Registry. We also work in digital preservation and around data and software skills training with Library Carpentry. So the DMP tool is a service that I run. Um, the DMP tool is a free open source community supported tool. We've been around for 10 years. We work from an open source code base that is also used by other DMP uh, service providers uh, all over the world. Uh, per our closest partners are DCC out of the UK where they run DMP online. Uh, so we have Initially, we have uh, really focused our work recently on creating next generational next generation machine actionable data management plans. So I'm going to talk about that specifically today. Uh, so I think most people are probably familiar with what's in a DMP. So I'm not really going to go into this too deeply. Uh, my main point in mentioning this is that within the DMP, there's a lot of really important information about the research data that's going to be generated through a project. Right now, most grant applications, it's just a static two-page PDF file that doesn't actually get shared out. So none of that rich information about a research project, about the data or outputs that are gonna be generated, nothing is done with that. That's not shared with other stakeholders, despite the fact that there's a lot of rich information that could be really important for stewarding FAIR data. So what we're trying to do with machine actionable data management plans is take that traditional static document, structure it, transform it, and make it so that it is shareable between systems. Um, this facilitates things like notifications and verifications, real-time reporting, compliance checking. Um, one piece that we're gonna be talking about specifically uh, with our space and the DMP tool is facilitating information about data deposits. So this is really important for FAIR data in terms of making sure things are findable and accessible. So I plan on creating X, Y, and Z data outputs where am I gonna put them? Did I actually deposit them? So machine actionable DMPs are a way to not only say what your intention is for where you're going to deposit your data, but to actually facilitate somebody being able to, to find that data once you've actually deposited it. And I'm gonna show you that piece of the workflow coming up. The other really important thing about machine actionable DMPs that I'm really committed to is making sure that they lessen the administrative burden on researchers and grant administrators. Our process is already <laughs> has enough steps in it. We need to be making things automated in the back end. It shouldn't involve anything extra for a researcher. In fact, it should make their lives easier um, and it should facilitate um, you know, better information about all of the uh, resources that they've been producing through their research. 
So at CDL, we've had uh, two uh, NSF grants. The National Science Foundation has funded our work in this area. We just finished our first grant, which was about active DMP. So in that grant, what we did was we transformed the DMP tool and we made it structured. So we made it so um, when you create a DMP in the DMP tool, it can spit out a structured JSON file that has identifiers within it, that has a unique identifier for that DMP so that we could exchange information with systems like our space. Um, so that was kind of part of this initial uh, grant from NSF. The grant that we have now that I'm going to talk a little bit about is the Fair Island grant. And in that grant, we are really building on sort of the preliminary infrastructure we built in phase one. And we're actually going out and using our machine actionable DMPs, integrating with systems like our space to really build out and develop the technical infrastructure that's necessary to make these connections possible between systems. So I'm going to talk really briefly about what we're doing right now, uh, really building on machine actionable DMPs and utilizing identifiers within the DMP to create a network of information about research. So PIDs for DMPs, unique identifiers for DMPs has always been kind of one of our most important entry points into creating truly interoperable, useful data management plans. So creating a unique identifier for a DMP creates an unbreakable link between that data plan and all of the eventual outputs. And it facilitates those connections and discoverability that support FAIR data. So what that means in practice, if for the more visual folks out there, this graphic here in the purple dot in the middle represents the data management plan. It's given a unique identifier, the DMP ID. All of the contributors that are associated with it are here off of that green dot with people. Um, these and all of these. So it has all that rich metadata that's in an ORCID record. And then as a project continue, as a project progresses, maybe they release some data sets. Uh, maybe they have some publications. Through the use of identifiers, we're able to track all of those eventual outputs. And behind each of those identifiers is a whole host of additional rich information that we can use to really fill out a data management plan and demonstrate the eventual impacts and, you know, of that actual research. So I think I skipped one. So one thing that we had to do in the DMP tool to support this was to put in what I like to call pitifying the DMP. So we put in PID in the data management plan wherever we could um, to put structure in the plan to create it so it was interoperable so we could exchange it with, with systems like our space. So we've got DMP IDs, uh, we've got ROARs for the research organization, um, uh, IDs for the funders, ORCIDs, we're using IDs for the actual data repositories, licenses, and metadata standards. And so when a researcher gets a DMP ID, they, that DMP ID does resolve to a landing page. Um, so this is just an example of what that page looks like. So it's got really basically high level metadata about the plan. So all of the contributors, these are all identifiers, project details, citation, funding source. So this would be updated as a project is, the, the funding is granted um, or perhaps not granted, um, project description, planned outputs. And then this part, other works associated with this research project, this is an important piece for the uh, integration that we're working on with our space because this is where as a project can progresses and eventually uh, articles are published or data sets, this is sort of a continually updating list of all of the outputs that are associated with this plan. So with that, I am going to pass it over to Rory and he is going to talk about this from the RSpace perspective. Thank you, Maria. Hi, everyone. Just let me get my screen sharing set up.
Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. I'll take that as a yes. Great, yes. thank you. All right. So, our space is known. Uh, it's, it's, it falls out of the product category, electronic lab notebook. And electronic lab notebooks are a digital replacement for paper notebooks typically used in the life sciences and related fields. And they have the paper lab notebooks have been used for, for centuries. Uh, digital electronic lab notebooks are relatively new. So that's how we started out 10 years ago. But as you'll see, uh, our space has actually evolved into something that's actually a lot more than an electronic lab notebook. It's become more of a, an actual digital hub for collecting organizing, managing, and sharing data in the active research phase, and importantly, passing data on for storage, archiving, and wider access. So we got started uh, about 10 years ago um, when we worked closely with a whole group of people at the University of Wisconsin, uh, which was interested in adopting an electronic lab notebook. And importantly, we worked with researchers, with PIs, but we also worked with the chief information officer, with IT people that were involved in, in data storage, with data librarians, with the commercialization office, with chemists. So really with, with a whole range of people in, in the research community at a large research university. And then built our space around academic, there are also uh, uh, electronic lab notebooks used in, in commercial context, but our space is more designed to support academic workflows it provides, as I said, a centralized hub for data. Uh, critically, one of the messages we got from the Wisconsin folks was that they wanted uh, it to be able to integrate with other tools that researchers already use. That picks up on a theme that Maria has, has mentioned. And it needs to be a conduit, not a silo. It needs to be very easy to get data out. That was, that was a core requirement we have. And so as you'll see, uh, it's now become something that connects data management planning. In the planning phase, it acts as the heart of the data, uh, of the data management and collection in the active research phase, and then data can be passed on for archiving and storage. And in so doing, it enhances reproducibility and verification of data. So these principles are uh, embodied in this um, in this diagram. So actually, not to belittle our space itself, but it's a very powerful tool where you can uh, organize your data, you can create structured data, you can. Uh, in, in import images, manipulate images. Uh, you can share your data. You can do signing and witnessing. You can do a whole bunch of things. But our focus is now more on the on the ecosystem itself. And uh, I'm going to unpack this a little bit and show you how each of these different things facilitates the movement from preparation to active research to archiving, storage, and reuse. So first of all, you can incorporate data from external resources into our space, into the record of the research that you keep in our space. So this includes uh, data that might be stored in, in things like Dropbox, Box, Google Drive, but also um, big data that you might be keeping on an institutional file store, something like your sequencing data uh, or your imaging data. Uh, we also integrate with, uh, we are doing kind of experimentally integrating with new kinds of data, uh, lab instrument data, uh, we integrate with tools, both uh, uh, big tools, if you will, big uh, big tech tools like Office 365, but also open source science tools like uh, Protocols AO and uh, others as well. And I'm not sure if your screen is obscured by it, but mine is. And down below, we also integrate with Slack and Teams so that you can uh, talk about, um, uh, you, can, you can collaborate uh, in addition to uh, as you're working. Um, crucially, we, uh, we enable export to um, data repositories. So we support the ability to export the data sets that you've created into public repositories like Dataverse and Figshare, where they can then be shared, queried, uh, passed on for publication, et cetera, uh, to support FAIR principles. Um, we, the focus of today is the integration with, uh, with uh, DMPs, and we'll, I'll talk about that uh, in a moment where you're gonna see the demo. Uh, so you, we now support the flow of, of data management planning, uh, making data management planning more of an active process, and then incorporating the 
uh, uh, both the data management plan and the associated data sets into the repository for the public record. Um, a recent thing that we've done is, which is extremely important, is incorporating uh, our, uh, the ability to put sample data. Uh, oftentimes, it turns out that certainly in, in the life sciences, samples get lost and information about samples is often missing or even not included, making it impossible to reproduce experiments. So with our new sample management system, this can also now be incorporated with the experimental record in our space. And then uh, again, the sample data and the experimental data can be put together into a public repository, making it possible to do a much higher quality um, uh, reproduction of experiments. So this is a view of how you typically our, our customers are our institutions, universities. So this is this is not my this is not our 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 graphic. It's is from the University University College London. And this shows their notion of the research data life cycle, which Maria alluded to and we're all familiar with. And this, these, you can see here the various places that we're interfacing in an, in an actual university environment with uh, the various uh, tools and resources that people use in the research uh, environment. In their case, uh, DMP online, um, our space comes in at the data collection. We integrate with their data storage capabilities and then uh, data deposit into things like, uh, in, that, in their case, they use, they use, um, they use Figshare. So very much this is intended coming back to the Wisconsin uh, concept to be something which, which an institution could deploy to enhance its uh, research data life cycle. So looking ahead, uh, that's where we are today. So what are we focused on at the moment? Uh, we're focused on uh, integrations with, with tool enhancements of our integrations with tools and resources, MADMPs, which is the, the focus of today's topic. We're enhancing our, our ORCID um, integrations. Uh, we, have, we, we have a lot going on with uh, PIDs, both in terms of incorporation of domain-specific PIDs like IGSNs for the geoscience community and RRIDs for the life sciences community into our space. And then uh, following on Maria's point about uh, incorporating um, uh, PIDs which come directly from DMPs. Uh, we're also interested in something else which which might be might might not be of interest to, to the, the, the folks on this call, uh, which is using the ELN uh, R space as a, as a data curation tool that's useful for for data stewards. So with that, that is my next slide. So now I'm this is a drum roll here. Uh, if we can get this video to play, it's going to be the first public showing of the actual integration between our space and the uh, DMP tool. So apologies, but this is quite, quite an exciting moment. Uh, I'll stop sharing and I'll share again. And if I can find the, oh, it's no longer here. Uh, just a sec. Find the... Just a sec, excuse me for a minute. There we go. All right, now let me try it. I think it'll work now. Okay, here we go. And this is my colleague, um, Vita Plankate, who has prepared this video. Here's a quick overview of the DMP tool and RSpace integration, which facilitates linking together the data plan and project outputs with minimal effort. I have here my list of DMPs in DMP tool, and I'm recording my research and storing the data in RSpace. I can easily browse DMPs inside of RSpace. I can filter by my DMPs and public DMPs and can select which DMP to import. Importing into RSpace will store the DMP as a PDF inside of the document gallery, which I can easily view 
as well as reference and link to within RSpace. The DMP will also update in RSpace when someone on my team makes changes to it in DMP2. Now, here's my research data for this project. I am ready to export my work. This is a straightforward process within RSpace, as I can directly export to an external repository such as Dataverse. I'll make an HTML export and provide the information Dataverse requires. After the deposit is confirmed, I can view all of the research data in Dataverse. Most importantly, a direct link to the exported materials on Dataverse is then passed back to the original DMP in DMP2 as a unique and permanent related identifier, which supports traceability and fair data. This identifier is also recorded on the landing page for the DMP. This landing page serves as a public-facing page listing all outputs related to the specific project. As additional datasets are published, these citations will be automatically added to the landing page, keeping the research materials and DMP in sync throughout the research process. Okay, there we go, and I'm going to pass it back to Maria. Alrighty. So I'm going to do this real quick because I do want to leave some time for questions. So I'm actually just going to skip over to um, what, uh, what we've done with our integration and where we hope to go. And I hope to leave a minute for questions. So this first phase step for the DMP tool because it's really one of the first times we've integrated with an external system. Um, so now we have the ability through the use of identifiers to keep DMPs up to date um, in our space by connecting um, outputs to a project. So our next step um, is so that, you know, what we're going to be working on going forward is that researchers will be able to ingest their DMPs in our space and edit those DMPs within that environment. Um, so really what we're hoping to do is to support data management plans as living documents um, in active research and post research. Um, so the idea being that our space users could get an inventory of all the outputs associated with the project and those could be tied back to their DMP. This could be used for grant reporting and compliance checking. Um, it's really good for fostering transparency in research. Um, our space is also looking in, as Rory mentioned, to pulling in all of the good PIDs that we've been collecting in the DMP tool so they can use them in our space. So that really helps researchers because they don't have to enter the same information multiple times. So we're you put it in in your planning phase, it automatically goes over into your active phase into your ELN. Um, and then an idea being that our space users could create or publish DMP metadata and get a, acquire a DOI for a text-based DMP that was written outside of the DMP tool, so within our space. Um, so I am going to actually stop sharing now because I, I think we have like two minutes for questions. Um, so I want to give folks a chance. If anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or chat them in. Um, looks like there's a question for Rory. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Samuel. I'm just reading the question. Okay, the question is, one of your slides stated that an ERN could be used as a data curation tool. Was the reference to curation in this case used during the active or passive data management phase? So, yeah, great question. So, if you think about it now, the, the repositories are the, are the go-to tool for data curators, and this data curation is a and data stewards is a huge and, and growing, uh, there's lots of more, many more people are involved in it. It's becoming a, a, an important activity. And um, the uh, right now, data curation takes place in preparation for, basically it takes place in preparation for deposit into a data repository like Figshare or Dataverse or Dryad or Zenodo. But actually that's far too late. Uh, the data curation could much more usefully begin uh, at an earlier stage during the active research stage uh, in terms both of helping researchers to organize their data in ways which would be useful for 
later deposit or just in terms of general um, uh, data organization. There are some uh, institutions that are actually experimenting with uh, domain specific data stewards so that the, the people who are doing the data stewardship role have a knowledge and training in, in the particular domain. Um, that not necessarily the case, but I think it would be particularly useful in those kind of contexts, but it, it would also be uh, more generally useful. So this is something that we're exploring, uh, for example, with, with a group at uh, uh, UIT, the Arctic University of Norway uh, and TU Delft, some of the kind of data curation pioneers, if you will. Good question. Um, we are at time. Um, I chatted in my email because I know we didn't leave very much time for questions, but I'm always happy to talk about um, this project or if you have thoughts or comments on machine actionable DMPs, happy to chat about that. Um, but I know we are at time. So thank you all for coming and um, enjoy the rest of the fair. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Rory. Uh, and thank you everyone for participating here. Uh, I see that uh, Maria and Rory pasted their email to contact them, please, please do. Uh, and uh, see you all tomorrow uh, to other interesting uh, demos, uh, lightning talks or workshops. Uh, thank you all.